So I guess we'll get started here. Um, welcome to another episode of uh, the Common Left Study Group. Uh, I am happy. I hope you guys are uh, having a good uh, Labor Day uh, today. I'm your host, uh, Ron Batum. Uh, today we'll be uh, discussing uh, in more in depth. We're gonna talk a little bit more in depth into and explore more in depth into the. Uh, object-oriented programming system into, in Common Lisp, that is a Common Lisp object system. The book that we are using to, uh, you know, travel our journey is a very nice book called um, Object-Oriented Programming in Common Lisp, A Programmer's Guide to Class by Sonia E. Keen. It was originally created, actually, um, while she was at uh, the now defunct uh, Lisp company, Symbolics Incorporated. It is a fairly... Um, it's a pretty, uh, it's a late 80s book, it was published in 1989, but um, it's still very valid today. A lot of the stuff that um, they wrote in there actually ended up going into uh, the common list standard with a few differences that we will um, discuss as we uh, as we continue our, um, our journey into it. Um, today, primarily, we'll be, uh, if you guys are following the book or if you do have a copy of the book, we will be covering, hopefully... Um, the majority up to um, chapter four, um, because the beginnings of the book is um, stuff that uh, we have covered in um, our previous episode in uh, Practical Common List, uh, particularly chapter 17 uh, on classes, as well as chapter 16, which is on generic functions. Um, that is actually where we're going to actually begin. I'm going to pull up our original um, discussion just to provide um, some context with um, folks who are coming in, so that way you could uh, reference uh, our code, which is actually available on GitHub at the Atlanta FP uh, slash. Um, it is at uh, sorry, it is at https. Uh, hold on. Oops, uh, for some reason, github.com slash Atlanta. Atlanta FP slash um, CL study group. CL study group. Thank you very much. For some reason my uh, Emacs is uh, a little slow today. Uh, All right. All right. So if you, I'm gonna to get started. I'm gonna first pull up our last discussion. Now, those of you who haven't actually um, uh, looked into class um, and just joining us for the first time, I'm going to give a very quick overview of what um, um, class Before is. we get going, yeah, you sorry. haven't streamed onto the Hangouts yet. Ooh, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I knew that I was missing something because I'm on the live stream, but... I <laughs> yeah, I... <laughs> I actually just pulled up the live stream to, to make sure that I wasn't missing something. Okay. All right. Awesome. Uh, and just get the stupid uh, task status bar out of the way. Okay. Can you guys still see my screen? I just want to make sure. Oh, uh, we can. Okay, excellent. Um, for some reason, um, I noticed that uh, when I minimize uh, the... Uh, the, the status bar, it like minimizes the window. So I wanted to double check that it didn't go and minimize the next window. Um, so very quickly, uh, the common list object system uh, basically is a full blown um, object oriented programming extension to common list. What I mean by an extension, I mean it is fully integrated into, into the common list um, language. Uh, We've discussed this when you saw um, uh, when we were talking about practical common list and it being introduced to this. But to just to review, um, the common list object system creates objects that are essentially Lisp types. So, like in this common list, every um, every uh, Lisp object is a type, whether it be an integer, or float, or string, or whatever. And uh, let me just uh, pull up my uh, Emac. Uh, one second. I need to go and open up 
my buffer for SBCL. Okay. So like if you do like a type of 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 one, you'll see that um, it it'll give you a proper bit. Uh, if you type in hello, it'll end up saying that it's a simple array of character, just like this. Um, in the com using uh, the common Lisp object system, um, every Lisp object has um, has a type, but it also has a class. So there is um, a separate uh, extension that allows you to explore the classes and the class hierarchy of your 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 instances. Now, those of you coming from other languages, I know we, we uh, I brought this up last time, but um, just to reiterate, um, this is a little bit different with, say, like if you're using Java or C++ primarily because um, in those languages, um, you have just types and um, abstract data types, but you don't have this sort of uh, separate hierarchy that you can explore necessarily um, in, in those systems. Uh, so that makes uh, this class a little bit different. Uh, some similarities between the, the, the type system that I wanted to bring up that um, really wasn't brought up last time, but it is kind of useful to know is, is um, any uh, common Lisp system, um, uh, common Lisp function, and can explore the different types of the, the primitive types that are available in common Lisp, um, like for example, you can actually um, define a function that uh, simply uh, extends um, the uh, and selects operations based on a particular type because common list provides you uh, something called type case that allows you to specialize and um, uh, select particular operations based on the type of argument that's being passed in. So like we can make a simple show function that takes uh, a uh, an object and then run um, a type case on this object to actually determine um, what type uh, that object is and then um, go in and uh, uh, execute a particular function that um, determines that object. So we could, uh, for example, um, it was, I have to remember my, my type case, uh, it is type case obj. And then I could specify uh, an object for it, and then it'll execute a function. The same way, um, let me just make sure. Uh, you yeah. actually want to unwrap the yeah. OPJ. That's what yep. I thought. Okay. So if this guy was an integer, we'll say, hey, um, a, a, an integer, or if this is a float, we could say, it float and uh, oops mistyped and then we can actually go in oh, for some reason it didn't actually see that and if we use this uh, function now in our in our REPL and we do show 5 it will spit out show an integer 5.5 says it shows a float and what um, what Lisp allows you to do is, is you can take these single functions based on a type case, you can go and dispatch on any any particular type. You could also include common Lisp object types if you really wanted to. So, but Clos actually goes further and gives us to you automatically gives you a far more flexible framework to actually um, do this kind of like type dispatch um, and through a new thing called multi methods, which we will which we will cover in a little bit more in depth. Uh, is there any comments? Did I miss anything? Well, multi-methods are closure. It's generic yeah, functions. Uh, Sorry, yeah. generic functions. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Yes. E easy to screw those two up. But, uh, <laughs> yes, I meant... <laughs> more, more people go searching for the wrong thing. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Using generic functions and the generic function hier hierarchy. Um, yeah. So what are the elements of a... Of a, of a what does clause really buy you? So it has that automatic association. It has the ability to do multiple inheritance. It provides you this flexible, you know, structure to do behavior. But what constitutes a, a clause program? Um, that's what you know we're gonna get started uh, with today. Um, usually, um, the basic elements of a clause program or anything is um, classes. Uh, 
generic functions and then methods that are built on those generic functions. Okay, um, classes are anything that are defined by um, uh, def class. Uh, those of you who are familiar with our earlier um, tutorial, I think it was last week or the week, before, it was actually the week before when we were talking about our map generator project. You may have noticed us uh, starting with um, uh, structures and then moving over to classes. Um, structures have uh, some similarities with the way classes work, but classes um, in class are far more flexible. Um, in particular, when it comes to inheritance, um, you have a pseudo, I guess I could say it's a single inheritance, like you can include the structure of a previous object type in 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 def, in a def struct. And um, internally it looks like that there are slots. Um, but uh, uh, class provides you far more flexibility. Is that a, a fair um, way of describing it, um, Elijah and Michael? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, a class definition is consistent of, uh, yeah, you know, the the class name. What is called here uh, has um, the uh, the it's the list of superclasses that the, the class is inheriting from. Um, there's some things about this um, that are um, particular to note, which is um, following what the what the what the Sonia uses in her terminology is uh, uh, anything that you include in this list of classes, like in this example here that we see with the checking account. Um, oops, I'm using the, um, that is basically uh, uh, a list of um, super classes where bank account is a subclass of checking account. Uh, but in particular, um, those, those objects that are in that list, um, they're called direct superclasses. And this is kind of important when we talk about dispatching because of um, uh, this issue of um, how does uh, methods uh, get uh, looked up and executed in terms of um, the precedence of the object. And, um, and I know I'm brushing in a lot of um, details that um, we'll go into more in depth, but this is just to get everybody up to speed very quickly. Um, classes obviously have member variables through the use of what are called slots. In this example that we have here, we have, um, sorry, for some reason, okay, I was using that. Um, we have a list of um, objects like customer name and balance, but here what I'm about to do is, is I'm going to you know, show what, 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 what is actually available um, for you when you are specifying these member var variables or these slots. Um, if you want to actually instantiate a object, um, well, if you want to um, specify a value for a particular slot when you're instantiating using make instance, um, in particular, uh, you would use something called init arg and specify a key that would um, be used when uh, calling make instance. Um, if you wanted to uh, specify a default value, and this is, I know we were discussing earlier about this, Michael, but I'm just going to bring this up a little bit. If you're not wanting to um, uh, specify uh, a value when you're using make instance, but you want to specify a a uh, default value. So here I'll just go ahead and say, you know, customer name. But let's say that we want a default default balance for any bank account, you know, just for the sake of example. We would use something called init form and then specify a uh, a value for that um, that that slot. Uh, there is a little bit of a um, a better way of doing this controlling of initialization, um, but um, there are rules as to when to use what, and um, uh, I'll come to that in just a, just a second. Um, finally, uh, one thing to note uh, to complete this discussion on class definitions, um, we have these things called accessor methods. So you can have uh, readers, uh, writers, and um, accessors. Um, a reader is nothing more than, you know, you 
you, you created a function that um, a function that uh, well class creates a function that I called this reader name so like in this case name we I, cre I created a function called bank customer when I define bank account um, and what this does is um, is uh, it will allow you to read the internal value but you can never change it um, if you want to be able to do read and write you would want to use um, an accessor method and what this does is is um, it will create both um, the reader method bank customer and it will create what's called a, a setf method um, and that allows you, as you recall in our previous discussions, to do something like set f bank customer some customer and then some value. And what this does is, is this actually uh, internally converts to um, whatever method that was over it that was created by um, class. Uh, a couple of other things that um, I wanted to um, bring up that uh, we haven't actually touched um, before, but I want to touch now, which is uh, the um, use of, uh, well, two things. One is um, local slots and shared slots. Um, what we have here, when we compile this guy, um, customer name and balance are called local slots. That is, instances themselves will have unique versions of these, um, these slots um, and they won't be shared between instances. If you wanted to actually share um, a slot between instances, you would use um, a shared slot. And the shared slot um, syntax looks like this. You specify, let's say that you wanted um, in terms of bank accounts, let's say that um, this may not be a good example for actually showing shared slots. Let me give another example. Let's say that uh, we are creating um, a triangle class. All right. This triangle class has four, three sides, obviously, and hold on one second. I'm just going to pull up, pull up my, my notes here on it. Okay, so this this triangle class, which um, for now we'll just say is is a um, a top level class, it's not inheriting from anything. And let's say that uh, it has three sides: side A with the accessor side A, and then we specify an argument called side A. And then let's do. Oops, not that way. That's what I wanted to do. So we have a side B, sorry, side B, side C, side B, side C. But let's say that we know for for sure that since this guy is a triangle, that the number of sides is always going to be shared across instances to being. Um, three, oh, right? Your accessor is side A. Oops. Um, wait, wait, yeah, you the can't... middle one. The middle one, yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh. Structy def class. <laughs> so, let's say that you wanted to always have this guy to be three uh, three so that if somebody wanted to check the number of sides in some application they can go ahead and do that so here in this case what we do is, is we would use a init form because it's fixed um, but then we would do something called allocation um, and allocation allows you to specify um, what type of allocation is it um, there's two types of allocation one is um, allocation instance which is what we were talking about earlier by default these valid, these um, three slots here, um, side A, side B, and side C, those are technically defaulting allocation to instance. Um, but here, we're changing the allocation to class to saying that, okay, whenever you make a new instance of this guy, 
this is shared across all instances. Uh, does that make sense to, to folks? Um, uh, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm introducing anything new here from what we discussed before. Uh, but if there are questions, let me know. Let's talk about uh, instantiation and constructors. Um, in a lot of examples that we did previously, uh, uh, we did um, we use we called make instance directly. Now, I, I I'm ignoring some of the initialized instance stuff that we talked about here because uh, this is we'll, we'll we'll come to that um, later on, but. Uh, but if you see our make instance here, you see that um, we're, we're calling make instance directly, uh, which could be okay, but uh, normally, uh, and I don't know what people's are thoughts on this, and I'm going to um, you know, put this up for discussion. Um, the book recommends that uh, uh, constructors constructor functions, that is like uh, making a local function called make bank account would be far more um, useful because it hides uh, details of um, what's being passed into make, in, uh, make instance. So this is uh, one point that I'd like to discuss with um, other folks here today, just to see um, is that still valid or do most people just use make instance directly? Well. Point is valid, and you've got echo, by the way. Oh, there it goes. Cool. Um, though that doesn't mean that I actually do that terribly often. There, there's another benefit to it, which is that um, it means that if you do uh, change your implementation at a later date, you don't have quite as much work to do replacing all the make instance calls. You just have to replace the one call in make bank account. Um, but to be honest, if I'm already pulling out class, I don't really mind leaking so much of that um, uh, information. And um, there are other ways of controlling how that works. Michael, your thoughts? Um, I think I think Elijah summar summarized it pretty good. Um, I I tend to use both. I mostly use the constructor form when, you know, it's part of the public API, and that's what I'm exporting to my users. Um, right. So so I, so I one question I had was regarding the public API, right? Not necessarily internally when you're writing your own stuff. Because I understand, you know, since you have your internals, right, this is, okay. it, 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 it's kind of a nice shortcut also. Um, although uh, even making it consistent in your code base might be a, a, a good, good idea. But from a public standpoint, is is that a leaky abstraction? Um, should you just use constructor functions, or should you um, allow people to call make instance directly? I think that depends on a few things. Um, for one thing, uh, is it part of your public API that these objects are class objects? Um, because if it isn't, then definitely people should not be calling make instance like at all. Um, if you haven't, you know, if you aren't, you know, exposing to them that these are class objects, you know, there's something that you can subclass or something that you can, you know, uh, specialize stuff on. Right. Then you, they, you should definitely have some actual constructor function of your own. Um, and, you know, it, it's possible that you, you, you may think it's a very good idea not to expose that something as a class, class uh, directly anyway. Uh, you know, leave that as kind of more of an internal implementation detail. Um, uh, and also, there are cases where it is actually easier to control something about how the public API works if you actually control the make instance invocation yourself. Um, you know, we, we actually saw a little bit of that in the um, uh, in the map generator when we were uh, looking at the options class, uh, mm -hmm. where we have uh, some validation logic that mm -hmm. you have to satisfy. Um, before you can um, create a, I forget exactly what it is that, that we were wrapping there. Michael, do you remember what that was? Valid, um, no. 
the place where we were doing wh where do we where do we call into the validation of the options uh, instance? Or is it right after you create it? I think it might be right after you create it. Regardless, um, uh, we we enforce that you can't construct an options object that has invalid slots, um, that has invalid values in its slots, basically by controlling how the constructor works, um, and not exporting. You know that you're supposed to use make instance by exporting our own constructor, and so there are cases where it'll be easier to do it that way. You can use clause stuff internally to like really enforce that, make it actually impossible to construct the object um, improperly using clause trickery. But it, it can be easier sometimes just to write your own wrapping constructor function. Well, it's pretty easy to do that actually using default init arcs, just default yeah. the init arcs to error or something. Right, right. But but you know, what if you need to validate that all the values that were passed in actually make sense? That is true. That's another case. Right. So um, there's a lot of other stuff that we talked about in um, our exploration um, with uh, into uh, OOP in our previous episodes on this, but I'm going to specifically skip to um, uh, sort of like a more in-depth discussion of, of uh, things like, you know, what we were talking about today earlier about creating instances, um, initializing them and so forth. Um, because the book actually has some very nice um, uh, examples and some, I would say, some good recommendations on on just on just that. Like you were talking about default init args. Well, most people know that um, you know, as you can see here, this this example of um, sorry, I keep <laughs> I keep. I just thought of space. a good example of when you would want to use default init args over init forms. Oh, excellent. So um, let's let's just quickly uh, review the, review this, and then um, I will I'll, I'll ask for that example. Um, most people, as I said earlier um, here, this is um, how you would pass arguments to make instance. This is an example, a simple example of a constructor that we're talking about. Um, it's n n nothing special, really. Uh, the the things that you would um, want to use say um in it in it forms with there's another option that you can you could leverage that um that michael was was pointing out and that is this notion of um default init args um default init args basically is a class option when you're defining the class itself um that you would leverage to uh, specify um, default values when you're making instances of that class. So, like the example that was in the book, um, I guess let's let's go with m your, your example so that it might be easier to execute and show. But the example in the book was talking about windowing systems um, for folks who have the who have the book. It's in chapter nine. Um, Michael, what's your example? Oh, I was just going to mention that um, and the args are purely to be passed as you know init args arguments to initialize instance which is a generic function um, that takes a whole bunch of uh, keyword arguments and also allows other keys for your own keys so the default init args that you, that you supply in def class don't even have to correspond to slots they can they can correspond to any of those keyword arguments that are accepted by initialize instance and since you can specialize on initialize it since they could be any of your own keyword arguments too interesting so, to give a simple example, because I don't think I have default init args anywhere here. Um, um, useful when subclass in the class. I don't think I made an example of this. Yeah. I, I don't have an example offhand. I can yeah. Come up so, with that. so I can. Uh, so the exa I'll just go with the example that's in the book. So the book example is like, let's say that you're using a windowing system. Okay. This is you know. Uh, if you're using, like, say, uh, you're designing um, a GUI uh, framework, uh, like Q, Q Tools or um, or McClim or whatever, uh, and you want to be able to, you know, have a feature where you can full screen a window. So, I apologize, my Emacs for some reason is a little slow today. I think I might be running too many processes right now. <laughs> um, 
give me just one second, I apologize. Um, let me just quit a couple of these programs so I can actually... Okay, Visual Studio Code should actually uh, uh, shrink my uh, memory footprint <laughs> and my processing power thing. All right. So, if we we're defining a full screen window, and let's say that we have a class called window, one way to use default init args is you can actually say default init args here, and you you can specify x position some you know zero zero y position zero, and then specify a height and width. And when you make instances of this guy. Um, let's say this is uh, uh, six, yeah, four eighty, and this is six forty. Okay. Um, and let's go ahead and you know make a dummy window class that uh, doesn't have anything, and just you know, we use a documentation string to specify this is just a simple base class, um, top level class of all. All windows. Um, this shows uh, one thing that um, I recommend people doing, and I'll show. Um, it's useful um, later on when we start looking into how uh, we can interact with these guys in the REPL. But um, having a documentation string in your classes, um, I think, is actually a very good practice. Um, some folks, I've seen some code um, where it's not used, um, primarily because of some belief that uh, the class name itself speaks to what the responsibility of the class does, which, you know, the day it was written might be the case that it, it was written with a particular role in mind, but it might have changed over time. So it's, uh, it's kind of useful to have um, uh, a documentation string so that folks can actually, you know, see what it's about when they use some of the default methods. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying. I know. I know. There's laughing. In I'm there. just. I, I. I was gonna say something, but I mean, I've seen countless times where the documentation string uh, used to mean something, but now it's completely different. <laughs> right. I understand. Um, updating documentation don't is update a pain. Their documentation all the time. <laughs> updating. So, don't buy that either. <laughs> updating documentation is a pain, but you know, sometimes it's kind of useful to <laughs> update your documentation. Like it also is kind of useful. Um, like in in the in, in the book, when it comes to like defining what are um, the def generics, which we will touch um, in a, in a minute, um, it mentions about uh, you should really you know specify your documentation strings on what the def generics does, so that you know when people do a describe, it actually will tell them what the interface is, so they don't have to go and you know uh, through your code to figure out how your interface should be used. Um, but you know, I, I digress. Um, when we do this and we specify this, and let's say that this window, let's actually go ahead and give this correct thing so that we can actually leverage this. And then arg position, sorry, position, and then accessor explanation. You'll see why this is the case because since we're subclassing there, the default init arg is getting everything from the superclass. So obviously, these needs to be specified. Otherwise, we will not be able to. The example won't execute. Um, let's see, height. Now we have a class called window, we have a class called full screen window. Wait, what did I mess up here? In depth class, full screen window. No, did I mess that up? We need to specify an empty list of slots. Yep. Right before the uh, default in the args, you need an empty list. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. That is true. All right. Give me a second. One. 
so there's an e you're saying that the init args is um this has no slots it comes after but, the list of okay, slots gotcha. right there okay. always needs to be a list of slots whether it's empty or not all right all yep. right so let me go ahead and compile this oh good all right so now let's do a make instance of full screen window To describe this guy. No, not describe. Let me inspect it. Just click on it. Yep. All right. So as you can see here, uh, when we inspect this guy, we it uh, it has our default init args. It didn't actually pass in anything. It has all the init forms. There's no additional slots. So default init args is very useful to specify um, some template of default arguments to an object, um, but um, there are certain rules that the that at least the book provides that I think you just mentioned that it may not be necessarily true um, that I wanted to at least discuss with um, other folks who might be more familiar with the uh, as well than I. Um, and that is, um, as I mentioned um, before, uh, if you intend to allow users to initialize a slot, I'm quoting from the book, um, then you should use init arg to declare a symbol for initializing the slot. And then use default init, init args if you want to give that init arg a default value. However, if you do not intend to allow users to initialize a slot, then never use the init arg argument, argument and always use init form, is what the book says. Now, I think, um, Michael, you said that that may not be the case in some situations. Is that, did I misunderstand what you said earlier? or did No, I, no, that, that makes sense. Okay. I, I would agree with that. Um, However, default init args, init, arg, um, are, init args are on slots. Right. Um, they're always on slots. Default init args is after the slots list. It's for the whole class. Yeah. It's what is passed to um, to make instance, um, which those those are arguments passed to make instance, which don't even have to correspond with slots. If you type in a, a call to make instance in the REPL. Okay, give me a second here. How do I, hold on, I think I just do quit to get out of that window. Okay, good. All right. Being dumb. All right. And you want me to do a describe on it or just make no, it? No, just, just, just make it. Okay. Yep. And then fill uh, in the name of the class. Oh. Uh, ah, there we go. Right. Okay. Full screen window. And hit space when you're done. And then show up. Oh, uh, sorry. Hit it. It's space again. Ah, there we are. Okay, now do you see on the bottom how we? Oh have, no, it's um, not actually showing the uh, defaults. Uh, it doesn't it, show it, the default, it, but it specifies the keys. I see the keys there. Yeah. It, wow. Yes. Um. But yeah. Um. Do you see how it has the allow other keys symbol there? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, that means if you were to specialize on make instance, um, you could actually supply your own additional keyword arguments that are used in the logic of making that instance. And default init args in the class specifier um, allows you to, you know, pass arbitrary keys to this function when it's called. Um, they don't even have to correspond with uh, with slots. This is purely the arguments to make uh, make instance. Exactly. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? I, I'm actually pretty sure that um, it's actually arguments to share to initialize. So oh, yeah. It's, it's a little I, outside. Yeah, I'm just a little outside the scope of what we're talking about. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's ignore that one. Right. My, my point is that they wouldn't show up if you specialized on make instance. They'd probably only show up if you specialize on initialize instance. Um, because I think they're actually added during... Uh, shared initialize. So, so but anyway, let's, let's let's dig in a little deeper in make instance, just so that you know we could complete this discussion on construction, uh, object construction, because I think it's a it's a very uh, a very important part of um, this discussion um, before we start talking about some other aspects of the object system, since we already provided sort of an explanation, and for folks who are you know just joining in on us. Um, Again, I refer to you uh, to the practical common list discussion. If you want a quick, you know, fly through of uh, of what class provides, this is a, a more in depth discussion on on what class is um, doing itself. 
when uh, you uh, construct an object using Macon, since I think, you know, for the more experienced listeners are there in, in, the, in the channel, uh, we call uh, the initialize instance generic function, right, to initialize a new instance. Um, by default, uh, we know that uh, class provides a default uh, initialize instance. That's the reason why, you know, this calling make instance with no arguments uh, works with full screen and still gives you a, prov a proper, you know, uh, full screen um, window object because you, although you didn't specify a, a an initialize instance method for full screen window, it still was able to create it. But what does initialize instance itself do? Well, it's an after method. Um, it's, you can't actually um, override the primary method to initialize instance because that's implementation dependent and it actually uses the internals to actually create the object uh, instance itself. But after the object instance is constructed, what you could do in the after method is go and change particular values um, uh, in um, your, your object uh, for uh, uh, you know, before you actually go and use that object. So I guess uh, this, you know, obviously requires us to talk a little bit about, you know, what the book calls and what most people probably are familiar with Klaus would call the, the core framework of, of, of um, Klaus, um, which is uh, Klaus methods uh, are are very, um, at least generic methods are, um, have a very different approach to actually modularization than other um, uh, object-oriented pro programming languages in that um, with a, a def generic, with a generic function, which I'll give you an example of a generic function here. Uh, let's say that you have an account balance here. Um, Def generic provides you the interface of a method, and what uh, you can do is, is if you have a top level class like bank account, you could actually um, create um, a function that does what's considered the bulk of the work of this particular operation. Like for example, balance regardless of any uh, any bank account accessing a balance is. Um, Pretty, pretty straightforward. You just you know call balance in the in the bank account information. Um, but if there's certain setup that you want to do um, when you before calling this top level ba balance function, you would have a setup method called a before method. And if you want to do some sort of cleanup or some sort of side effects to that uh, um, to uh, a object instance you would have what's uh, called an after method. So I would uh, I would encourage you to look at uh, where is the example of my after method. I had an after method. Like in this case with initialize instance, um, we would have we'd have the ability to go in and do some cleanup or in this case update our object to actually go in and modify values. Um, yeah it's important to to mention that um, when you're defining a class with def class um, init forms cannot refer to previous slot values. So in an after method is a good time to, you know, do some logic if this slot depends on this slot, change this slot, basically. Right. That's a good point. Um, because um, make instance cannot um, leverage um, previous value um, construction to update um, uh, internal um, the internals of an object, so like if you pass in like a flag, like in this case, um, uh, we're checking the account balance um, that was passed in before the uh, during the construction to see um, what type of an account um, this uh, object, um, this account instance will be. Uh, you'd have to do that in this initialize instance after method because like and that's because of how initialize um, make instance works and how initialize instance actually works. Uh, it just simply assigns the um, instance variables to whatever values that are passed into make instance. Um, it uses the existing class machi machinery, particularly the after methods, to allow you to do additional work outside of just basics of object construction. This actually, in my opinion, sort of changes how um, you would approach uh, 
defining um, your object-oriented program, right? Because in um, in languages like Java, you have this thing called super that will allow you to call the super classes method, and you can control where it is in the execution. Um, and that could get unwieldy in certain cases, um, and it may not actually work in certain cases. Um, here, you've isolated all the changes for side effects to the setup um, and the cleanup. So that is the before method, before you call uh, your, 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 your object instance, and then the after method, where you clean up whatever the primary method does. And in this case, we're basically updating our instance in the after method because the primary method, all it did was is, you know, allocated some memory, created this object, and returned it. That's, and in fact, if you follow that, and the majority of um, uh, class programs essentially follow that, um, it makes things a lot, a, a lot easier to, to at least debug because you know sort of where your side effects would occur. Um, it's either in the before method or in the after method. Um, the primary method may not actually do any additional um, side effects to the object. It may just do some sort of calculation and return a value. Um, are there any questions from um, other folks in the, are, are we good so far? Uh, Mr. Primus, I see that you're, you're kind of listening. I'm kind of curious. Uh, I guess, uh, okay, all good. All right. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about in object initialization, there was one more thing. Uh, we talked about constructors, we talked about reinitialize instance. Oh, reinitialize instance. Yeah, let's not go there yet. We're, 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 we haven't even. Uh, we have fair to... point. <laughs> fair point. Okay. There's a lot of stuff in uh, in in that those last two chapters in the book that I don't want to um, really. Uh, touch until, you know, we finish off, you know, at least if, uh, what, um, you know, accessors and how um, methods are called and stuff. Uh, so, we talked a little bit about um, uh, de generic functions and def methods. Obviously, de to repeat, def generic is your interface, def method is an implementation of that interface. Um, uh, that's the e I would probably be that's probably the closest analogy I can I can I can actually come up with uh, to folks coming in from other 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 languages. Um, outs after that, beyond that, there 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 there's some differences. Um, for example, um, class precedence. Um, this issue of class precedence is um, very important. Um, but let me do one more thing before that. I just forgot that I should mention this. Um, let's talk about object construction just for one more thing. Uh, I want to mention one more thing that I, I, I forgot to mention, which is uh, whenever you create an object inside Common List, especially in your REPL, Common List provides you some machinery to inspect the object. We just saw one thing like that. When you inspect the object, it goes into the slime inspector. The slime inspector is actually calling some common list functions to, um, you know, inspect what is actually available in that object instance and allows you to explore the objects. Um, you can actually, uh, if you're on the command line and you're using um, uh, and defining, you know, your program, you can actually uh, get some conveniences if you leverage um, in, and this is what I tend to use, um, two specific um, methods. One is um, uh, print object and the other is uh, describe object. Um, now, those of you who have a copy of Sonia's book, this is where um, the differences come in. In Sonia's book, um, it says that you can override describe directly. That I don't think you can do anymore. No, you cannot. <laughs> no. Uh, can... I'm pretty sure describe isn't even a generic function anymore. It is not. It is not. Um, so if you guys are copying code from Sonia's book and trying it out, you're going to hit this wall and you'll be wondering what the hell 
Yeah, the actual <laughs> generic function is describe object. It is describe object now. So, like, we can write in, um, for example, our full screen example. Uh, where is it? Full screen. We can define, you know, a method called print object that grabs our object and call it a full screen window. And the stream. And we could just go ahead and you know specify what we want to um, specify into the stream. So we could say simply um, uh, uh, type. Let's say that we have type and and uh, x position, y position, width, and height. I know I'm not using all the format specifiers here, but you know I'm just going to use A here for, for everything for the time being. And we could just go ahead and do type of object here. We could um, uh, go ahead and call um, next position um, of the object form position height. Now, if I call print and take the previous argument, you see that what we get is the type of the window and x position, y position, width, and height. This is kind I of useful. I don't like that at all. <laughs> um, that that just that's sort of implying that it's a vector. Yeah. You're supposed to use the uh, less than symbol to signify that it's a that's unreadable a, object. Thank oh. you. That's probably a. A good good notation that I should I should know. <laughs> That's a very good point. <laughs> yes, that and, is. Uh, actually, of course, you can just pull out print unreadable object directly if you really want to. You okay. know. Print do this properly. Print but, unreadable uh, object. That's what we did uh, a couple of weeks ago, if you remember, when we um, yes. wrote a printer for our cells. We could actually see their position in the stage as we were inspecting them. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, I, I need to grab that from, from this and then probably pull that up in in, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in another episode because I don't think I have that code on me. Um, I might be able to pull it up. You said print unreadable object? You yep. actually have a macro for it in our uh, utility library. Ah. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe I should um, pull up. Let's just go ahead and do this at the top. Use AFP utils library. And yes. I know I shouldn't be doing this unless I if I use a system definition, but for for the sake of today, I'm just gonna go ahead and do it that right. way. Right. Yeah. Just so everybody knows, um uh, well, firstly, wrap that in an eval when. At the very uh, least, yes. if you're gonna have to do this, <laughs> wrap that in an eval when. Got it. Uh, but uh, but for the record, uh, don't don't stick calls to quick list quick load in your files because there are some CL programs that will actually fail to compile properly if you uh, if you're loading them um, during compilation of other code basically, and I don't know why. Uh, but I know that they do. Um, Serapium, for example, one of its dependencies, not Serapium itself, but one of Serapium's dependencies will actually um, break sometimes if you load it in that way. Um, which means that actually, since AFP Utils uses Serapium, um, you know, we could actually run into that exact issue while we're doing this. It seems to be functioning fine right now. But I've I've run face first into brick walls involving QL quick loading Serapium at compile time. <laughs> really? That's yep. interesting. I did not yeah. know that. I, I I try I in general don't don't like doing that just because I would try to stick this in like a package, but I realized right. yeah. um earlier when I was before the, um our broadcast today, uh that I forgot to actually make the entire like 
practical common look like directory into essentially um, a package that people can just load and try out the examples. So yeah, need, no so, system definition. Yeah, I have no system definition. So that's kind of like uh, something that that's my fault. I should I should have done that, but uh, I, I forgot to, and I have to go and go back and update it. <laughs> um, so you said, hold on, I'm going to go back to where we were earlier. Which is would be AFP utils defined printer if I remember correctly. AFP That's right. Utils define. Come on. Do we have smart print strict mode off, or are we just unbalanced right uh, now? I think I, when I deleted it. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure you have smart print strict off. Oh no, um, clever prints. You don't have clever prints turned on. Okay. Um, when I installed um, uh, your your sly layer, I thought I would get all that um, turned on for me. There's an option you need to enable that. Um, so so here, simple way to fix it in this buffer, and we'll walk you through how to fix it properly later. Okay. Uh, run clever parens mode. It's a command. Ah, uh, evil clever parens mode actually. Evil uh, clever. Ah, okay. That's the one. That'll make things like um, the uh, vim delete bindings not unbalanced per ends. Ah, good. Okay. Yeah, but still the delete key will unbalance them. Now. Really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh. You can you so can backspace cut, it. For it will yeah. it will it will only cut that. That's cool. Not, so not backspace, but delete. Delete will delete a per end, a single per end, leaving hmm. the other one intact. You nope. Could, no, I just did X. Both. Yeah, I did X and it just deleted it. So. Um, yeah, but it deleted both of them. Yeah. What isn't that supposed? What it's supposed to do? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's a Lisp binding, or so that's a, that's a Vim binding. But anyway, okay. yeah. So okay. AFP utils define printer. Define printer. Okay, and for some reason I'm not getting. You have the latest version of. Oh no, there it is. Yeah, I have to specify. I have to do it twice for some reason. Um, so object is just a, a name you want to you know refer to it as. Oh no, object is the actual object name, the class name. Ah, the class yeah. name. Okay. Full screen window. You have to have this wrapped in a per, in parens. Yep. I have to wrap. Oh, put, okay, put, got put it. Put that in the list. Do uh, space K W. Yeah. W. Yeah, I've been using space K W so much now that it's uh, it's becoming it's one of those things now that I becoming second nature finally um all right and the stream i guess i should just say stream stream um type uh, identity. do type t. type t and identity probably don't care about identity that makes it include a pointer gotcha. it includes the actual address and if you care about that i can just grab this guy and then just take that body of code yeah and this here uh, and replace all the occurrences of obj with a uh, full screen window. Gotcha. Hit space se. Oh. No, 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 no. Go to obj. Go to object, or obj, and, uh, yeah, space, space, space se. All right. And now hit shift j a few times. Shift j. Okay. Yeah, keep hitting it. You notice it's highlighting oh, down to yeah, stop. I see it. There. And then I can just shift see it. Yep. Full screen. Oh, that's cool. Well, I'll do that with mine. Hmm. So, hit escape twice to actually exit. Yeah. There. Cool. That should do it. That's actually cool. All right, and this is this will essentially do the same thing. Of me. oh, uh, actually, uh, well, this this will work. It'll do something really silly though. Uh, try it. <laughs> oh, first uh, I have to make a new make instance. Okay. <laughs> you you see it, Michael? Yeah. Yeah, but that's partially our fault. Come on, there you go. All right. What yeah. The heck? Oh, you see what it did? Yeah, I did see what it did. Hit. Yeah. So, firstly, remove the angle brackets and the tilde s and the angle bracket on the end, and also remove the type of full screen window. There you are. Just, yeah, that's all you need. All right, hold on. Let me just do this again. By the way, interesting note on type of. Ah, that should only ever be used in the REPL. 
Uh, yeah. Should only have never. It, it has implementation uh, dependent behavior. Right. Um, what about type P and subtype P? Th there's. Uh, yeah, those are fine. Okay. Yep. All right. So for folks um, uh, who aren't familiar, type P basically allows you to check to see if um, a particular value is of a particular type. Um, and uh, it originally was written for the common list types, but it was extended for class. Um, so now uh, you can actually uh, you can leverage common list classes as if they're common we should, list types. And we should finally actually explain how that works. Yeah, I think that's a, a very important <laughs> um, segue. I believe it has to do with the implementations that are allowed to upgrade el array element types. Oh yeah, so so firstly, the reason why you don't want to use type of anywhere but the REPL uh, is that um, a, the type of a string, for example, um, is uh, is implementation defined, right? Whether or not you'll get um, a character vector or string back. So wait, wait a second, so if I do hello world here, okay, mm -hmm. let's just do that. You're saying that it will never, it may not be a simple array in all implementations? Correct. There's actually a recipe in the recipes book that says that he tried this on six different implement, or no, yeah, six different implementations and got, got four different six. results back. Yep. Interesting. So we need to... It's perfectly valid for that to return just string because string is a type. Right. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so, you can do type P and give it a, give a string and then say string is the type and that'll be T. Um, so it's perfectly valid for that to return string. So if I do type P, let's try this. So let me go back to my static example here. And say, I guess, say string like that. And it yep. should... Oh, well, that's interesting. So why isn't it... <laughs> now that, that begs the question, why hasn't... SPCL because simple too? array character 11 is a subtype of string. It is. Okay, let's see this. Um, um, not all string literals. Yes, subtype P. Huh, interesting. Okay. Yep. Uh, because all strings are character vectors, and a simple array character uh, 11 is a subtype of, char of vector character, I think. I think. Uh, and so you, you can so a val valid returns from that. So part of it, right, is that a, a string is actually a, a, a couple of different possible things. For example, um, a string could be not just a character vector, but it could also be a base character vector, um, which uh, which allows for um, it basically restricts the the characters allowed to be roughly ASCII um, and. Um, it allows a much more efficient representation, and implementations are free to when you use a when you use a string literal. They're free to give you a, a base char vector um, if the characters that you wrote there are all base chars. So it's possible that if you use a string literal, for example, you you, you may you may not get a simple array of characters. You'll get a simple array of base characters, and it's it's even it's it's all kinds of tricky. There are, there are a lot of different little array types that are all considered strings. And so when you when you do type of and then a string literal, it, 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 any number of possible things might come back. Interesting. Um, so, Interesting. you know, okay. and when you when you like when you do type of like fifty five, right? It would be valid for the implementation to return an integer between fifty five and fifty five. That's a valid type specifier for that. <laughs> it's not a useful one, but it's a valid one, and it's a very specific one. It's probably the most specific type that includes that integer. The set of integers between 55 and 55. Um, but it's not the useful one. It's not the one you're expecting. What you're expecting is fixed them. Um, because, you know, if, in, if if an implementation can't represent 55 as a fixed them, you have problems. Right. Right. That's um, a very valid point. Okay. So there's a function useful for checking all this called upgraded array element type. Yeah, well, upgraded array element type is useful for that. It's not perfect. Um, upgraded array element type will upgrade too far in a lot of cases. Um, but uh, upgraded array element type is used to tell you. Um, so if you request if you request an array of a specialized element type, implementations are free to um, 
uh, upgrade to a slightly more general element type if they don't have a specialized array type of that type, uh, of that element type. Uh, for example, if you ask for an array whose elements are, um, you know, 5-bit integers, what you'll probably get back is an array of 8-bit integers, at least on SBCL. Um, and you can test this. You can do make array, you know, 20 and then element type unsigned byte 5. Um, make array and, 20. Said, and said... Element uh, type. Element type. Uh, unsigned, Quoted. Oh, yeah. Quoted in parens, unsigned byte 5. Okay. And then it asks for the array element type of star. If I remember correctly, I'm pretty sure that's the name of the function. I could be wrong. Oh, yeah, no. Unsigned byte 7. SBCL has a 7 bit <laughs> byte specialization for array element types. That's interesting. I wouldn't have guessed that. But the point is that if you, there's a function you can call that will tell you how that maps. It's called upgraded array element type. Um, you give it a type specifier for an element type, and it'll tell you what this implementation would actually use as the. Um, yep, uh, so do upgraded array element type star. Upgrade. Yeah, uh, well, star star. Or no, uh, unsigned oh. by five. Yeah, I'm just trying oh, to see oh, what it is. Okay. Is it upgrade array element? Is it upgraded up dash array element type? Gotcha. Hit tab. Okay. Ah. Hold on. For some reason, when I hit escape, it just like goes into this weird like. Uh, that's not. What no, I want. that that's. That's not abnormal. That's escape doesn't do that. You need to use Q. Okay. If I were to guess. I. I, I did, um, when I do, I do control brace instead of actually hitting the escape key directly, so that's just probably me accidentally hitting something. I'm pretty that. sure that those do the exact same thing. They should, because that's uh, what Vim does. They, <laughs> that's the proper well, Vim problem, no, right? Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there there's actually a, a remapping going on in Emacs' input system that remaps those to be the same input event. Uh, but hitting escape repeatedly doesn't always take you back to normal state. Okay. Uh, is is the issue. Type. And then pass that unsigned byte five. Oh, you want me to pass in the the type. Okay, gotcha. Okay, hold on a second. I just want to see the file, the signature here. Oh, inspect optional environment. All right. Yep. Okay. Interesting. Okay. However, if you give it a really weird one, like uh, unsigned byte, uh, like sixty-five, you'll probably get integer back. And if you give it something like, um, uh, what's, uh, or character T, give it, give it as a type or character T. Or character T. Okay. Yep. I can almost guarantee you what it's going to return. It'll return T. Um, or character T. All right. Yep. yep. Actually, there's no uh, specialization of that type. Unsigned byte 64 returns unsigned byte 64. Yeah. And unsigned byte 65 returns T. Yeah. Um, but that's because we're on a 64-bit machine, and right. SBCL has a really efficient representation for 64-bit integer arrays. All right. I'm curious if you do anything smaller than 24, what you get. Ah, okay, so it upgrades it. Gotcha. So I find it really interesting that SBCL has ones for unsigned byte 31 as well as unsigned byte 32. No oh, idea that that. <laughs> I'm anyway, guessing because that's not important. I, I guess because uh, the base is twenty, um, is seven bits. There, um, that it just went. It just added seven and then returned it, rather than making it an eight bit. The next mm, eight, probably. That's just me guessing. I don't know if that's true or yeah, not. Yeah, I don't know. 
honestly. It's hard to say. Yeah. Well, I mean, SPCL has specific cases for each of these types of arrays. It has separate types internally for them. Right. Um, these specialized array types. But anyway, okay. uh, so how the class hierarchy relates to the type system. So uh, we do need to go over that eventually. Might as well be now. Yeah. Um, so uh, basically, each every class is a type, um, and most of the time, um, when you have a simple type, a type that's just a string, not a string, a symbol. When you have a type. So when you have a type specifier that's just a symbol, that's actually a class. Uh, so integer, for example, is a class. Um, you can actually say class of and then pass it. Or sorry, no. Uh, cla find class. Find class. Find class, right. That's right. Um, find class and then pass it in quote. Yeah, pass it a quoted symbol integer. Yeah, it's a top built-in class. So. Yeah, that's a class. Um, so every class is a type. Um, not every the other way around. <laughs> correct. That's the important thing, not the other way around. Um, so uh, types can be much more precise than than classes. Um, a class describes um, classes have a very rigid hierarchy. Uh, you have you know the the list of superclasses, the uh, list of subclasses. Um, and you even have an ordering to the superclasses, uh, so you can you can not only say you know I I inherit from this and that, but I inherit from this first and that second, which is important. We get to method combination and um, specificity, and so uh, with. The built-in classes. These are these are not class classes. Um, this is one of those important little things to know. Uh, well, they are. They are. They aren't standard classes. Is the technical term for it? Um, they're built-in there, classes. There's a way of actually. Um, if there's a if there's a way for us to actually get the class hierarchy right. Like if we do like uh, um, inspect the class yeah, object. Yeah. So we need to inspect. Uh, no, just, just click on it. Oh, just click on it. Just click on it. Yeah, I keep forgetting that I can just do that. All right. So in our, as you can see here, we have this thing called class precedence list, and class precedence list will. And you can click on that too. <laughs> ah, yes, everything's clickable. All right. <laughs> um, the order in which this is being displayed, folks, um, is most specific to least specific. So you could see that number. T is essentially the single object, the global object that every, everything's a subclass of, whether it be um, yep. uh, your class classes or your um, your pr primitive types, which are built-in types. Um, they're all going to end up being subclasses of T, much like small Built-in classes. Built-in classes. That is important. Yes. Built-in classes, right? That's correct. That's true. Yes. Built-in classes and class classes, both subclass from T, not built-in types. Yeah. Be yeah. Very, built-in very... classes and standard classes. If you really yeah. want to know the technical terminology. But standard uh, class you... is subclass of standard object, isn't it? So uh, really, or is it the other way around? Yes. A standard class is a subclass of standard object. Yes. Standard object mm -hmm. is the rootmost standard class. Right. Uh, and actually, really we can actually go and look at that. Um, from by Yeah, if you find that. class standard object, you'll you'll be able to see that. Um, let's just create, you know, just to show you guys, um, oh, based on what we did earlier, let's create another example, another instance of full screen window here. Um, and let's just inspect it, and then get the, I should be able to get the class list. Right? Yep, there's the class, so if you click on the class, here is the class precedence list. So yep. you see, um, we have our standard class, our standard classes, the subclass of window, which is a subclass of standard object, and then and then, then we hit the, internal stuff. Yeah, <laughs> we go to very internal stuff, and finally we hit the system class, which is slot T. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> consider yeah. and uh, <laughs> structs will actually have you know struct object. Uh, yeah, structure object. Uh, structure technically object. speaking, every every struct also defines a class. Right. Um, 
um, it is not a standard class. It is a structure class, which is important. On the um, behavior if you specialize then on them. Uh, no, you can specialize on structure classes. Um, not necessarily. I'm on absolutely certain that you can specialize on structure classes. I'm going to check this now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll be back in a minute. We about it last week. <laughs> we, we talked about what it. Do, what do you mean by specialize on? Generic function. Yeah, you can do that. You I'm absolutely implementation defined. No, you can't access the slots of a structure class using slot value. Yeah, that's that's, that, that's right. That's a, that's a, that, 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 that's yes, correct. Right. But you can, I am absolutely certain, specialize a generic function on a structure class. Uh, we could create an example. I mean, let's create a dumb well, example. Well, keep, keep in mind that any example that you do is going to be dependent on the fact that um, SBCL implements structure classes using class. Ah, uh, okay, never mind that. That <laughs> throws away. So SBCL is not a good place to be checking this. <laughs> Uh, let me see if like, I have, um... Can you slot value on a, on a, on a structure, um, on a struct in, in SPCL, for example? Um, sorry, um, I had to step away for a minute. All right, I'm just going to see, I have CCL. Can I, does CCL have that problem? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we could, we could, we could try it. Let me just open up CCL here, give me a second. A little bit of a second to, to load it up. Right. It just says that it needs to be a class. A specializer is either a symbol or a class. It's a symbol which denotes the class named by that symbol or a class itself or an EQL form. It doesn't say standard class. It doesn't say built-in class. It doesn't say structure class. It just says class. <laughs> Looks like um, I'm having some trouble loading up a uh, closure um from Roswell on my um, my setup, I have to go and look mm. into that. Um, that's interesting. I didn't because like you can you can specialize generic functions on built-in classes as well. I know this for certain. Right. Um, and built-in classes are are just as different as structure classes are to standard classes. So uh, this is this is this this actually classes. delves into something that um, that actually uh, we're hitting right where I wanted us to to to. To finish up today, which is um, common list type and extending writing methods that extends common list types, um, because one thing to note is is while you may not be able to, um, and this is just for folks who are who are listening on this, um, while you may not be able to actually override and rewrite certain basic types like the built-in classes, you can extend them. You can actually write methods that, um, yeah, and generic functions. Um, you know, that are specialized on those primitive built-in classes um, that are available to you in the in your Lisp system. So like you could, for example, um, the example that they gave is a little bit uh, contrived. It's more for serialization. So they talk about encoding strings in the book. But um, I guess we can, we can go ahead and, you know, try this out just for the sake of example. Let's say, let me open up uh, here uh, a new... Uh, we go on to this guy over here. This it's all gone. All right. Let's say that we created, you know, two generic functions called encode that takes in an object and a string, and all it does is it encodes the object to the string. Why the heck did it do that? No. Thank you. Shoot. That's not what I wanted to do. All right. Okay. Encode the object. To yeah. Sorry, I was confused there. It is. Um, I was talking about slots, not um, yeah generic functions. It, um, with slots, it actually expands to slot value. So right. With slots too. And the, sl the slot value page says that um, note in particular that the behavior for conditions and structures is not specified. Correct. So you could use it for defined condition either. Oh, right, yeah. Conditions are their own class type as well. Yep. Conditions have their own uh, meta class. I always forget that. <laughs> That's because nobody uses them, but they should. <laughs> Most so, underrated feature of common list, in well, my opinion. Well, I mean, people clearly use them, they just don't use them enough. 
what, what are they not using? The conditions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the condition system, I think, is fantastic. Uh, and I do agree that it is kind of like... Oh, they, they don't actually specify the meta class of class condition at all. It's, it's not specified explicitly. It's, it's, isn't it a, a sibling of a standard object? I thought standard condition or something like that is... Uh, um, it's just condition. It's just condition. Uh, okay. the, the, the point is that conditions might be standard classes. They don't have to be. Right. Let's say that we Conditions have... could be their own part of the class hierarchy, or the, the, the class hierarchy altogether. They could be their own thing entirely. In which case, no, condition would not be a sibling of standard object. Per se. Per se. All right. So I mean, the thing is, you can you can make an argument that structure object is I think it's called structure object uh, is a sibling of standard object, but they have different meta classes. So. So given these two generic functions that I've just defined here for encoding and decoding um, integers to a string, um, we could, you know, obviously specify a method that um, is specialized on, say, integers, all right, that takes in the stream. And all it does is, is um, it uh, checks to see if um, we have a negative number and if it is a negative number, we could go ahead and write a byte. Um, this guy is a negative integer to the stream. Okay, give me a second here. I need to make sure this is, these guys are here and loaded into my REPL. All right. And then we can obviously then um, uh, that Q uh, number of bytes to the absolute value, and then we can just go ahead and write this guy to um, the, uh, for, for the time being, I'm going to ignore, I can just do this, writing out um, positive one in a second. Now we can just go ahead and then, you know, just for simplicity, I'm just going to go ahead and um, uh, write the number of bytes in the string. Um, just create a lot. Figure out how many bytes our integer represents by taking the ceiling of the integer. Uh, the number and divide by eight. Uh, and we can just go ahead and write how many bytes that we are going to have into the stream and do this. Now all this basically what it does is, and the main takeaway from this is, is that you could go ahead and specialize this guy on um, on integers, or you can also specify it on you can specify it on say strings, and we could just go ahead and do that too as well. You know, just very quickly. If I just had something like say, you know, def constant string. Ah. What are, I'm sorry to interrupt, Ram. What are, what are we talking about right now? I had to step away for a few. Oh, I'm saying that um, because we were talking about earlier about extending um, um, because whether or not we can actually deal with uh, common list types as if they were um, classes inside um, um, class, right? Um, and, you know, uh, method specialization. Um, this actually brought up uh, kind of like the last topic that I was talking about, uh, that I wanted to talk about, which is actually the end of Chapter 4, which deals with saying, hey, well, not only um, uh, can you actually define methods on, you know, your own user-defined classes, 
although you can't modify um, the primitive built-in classes that are available to you in your Lisp system, what you can do is extend them by writing, you know, def generic generic functions and ma um, def methods um, that are specialized on those types. And one example that was uh, given in the book is uh, serializing um, uh, the primitive types to uh, some stream of some sort. Like if you're writing, for example, uh, a network application, you want to write your own, you know, um, proprietary um, serialization protocol, which there are so many available as a library, I'd first recommend that you go and look at, you know, those that are available before you go and write yeah. your own. <laughs> um, but if you decide to do it, you can. And the reason you can do it is that you could just simply, you know, isolate your, 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 your encoding and decoding into a series of, you know, def methods that are specialized on the particular primitive types. Um, and you can just go ahead and do it that way. Um, and then you can also specify for your own user-defined types. But common list, um, and particularly class, it doesn't stop you from doing that. Um, in fact, I would argue that, um, and I don't, and I've, I, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit of a fan of um, computer history, but I don't know of a language other than that was before common list that gave you this ability to extend, well, other than maybe small talk, that allow you to extend primitive, uh, your, the standard classes that are available to you in your system. Um, and that only res recently became a thing with extension methods like, say, in C Sharp or extension methods. I think you could do extension methods in Java um, and all the other languages that are, um, that are now available. But Common Lisp had it for 20 years, maybe 30 years already. Um, so that's something to think about. You know, there's a lot of other things that are available, but this is one of those features where I'm just like, well, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> extension methods aren't a new thing. It's not something that people should be, you know, raising their hands up saying, hey, we have extension methods. You know, it's not, you know, something brand new. Um, it's been there. You just got to pick the right language to actually go and do your thing. Uh, that's all I was talking about. Okay. I just wish we had portably extensible sequences. Oh, let's not get started on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I wish... Uh, Zulu was here. <laughs> User-defined sequences is the one thing that um, SBC Hell has, and I think Allegro has, but I, not, but I don't think he implements the same interface, um, I think. Yeah, SBC Hell actually implements an interface described in a paper. Right, and I wish more, more um, Lisp implementations implemented it, but you know there it, there are much there are much more particular battles I want to fight about implementations implementing things before I get to extensible sequences. Oh yes, well, but uh, that's a story for another day. One of the things we should, we may want to do is this a special episode where we talk about things we want. In Lisp. <laughs> well, we'd have about the first few episodes on packages alone. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna take. I'm gonna make a minor nitpick about that code and say that you should surround your constants with the plus symbol rather than prefix them with a percent sign. Oh, sorry, I got it's that from style. the that I got that from the book. The book was using. Percentage. Oh, okay. I didn't know this. You were copying this verbatim. Okay. Yeah, this was verbatim from the book. Um, uh, changing it uh, to modern style. That's a very good point. Um, because I was going to check this in and I was going to update it, but I was quickly getting it into um into the, uh, the, the, code bay, uh, the code base so we could discuss it. So, but while we're on the subject, I may as well update it. Um, but I'm actually um, done with um, what I was going to be discussing today. Are there questions or comments from, from folks? Um, I haven't seen anything from our, our live stream. There is no one watching on the live stream right yeah, now. That Just is, so you know. That's amazing. <laughs> Okay, why am I not surprised? I knew it was given that it was Labor Day. I wasn't sure. Labor Day, yeah. <laughs> Maybe watching. people will watch the uh, video and comment on it. But, Keep an uh, eye on that for a few days, I suppose. Uh, Richie, are we, are are we good, Mr. Primus? Uh, do you have any questions? And I hope he's typing in all good. Up. Oh, ah, all right. Yep. Oh, sweet. Okay. Uh, what questions? Go ahead. Oh, is he saying yep because, oh, no questions. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, if that's the case, um, I'm going to end. I know this was a very quick overview of what we 
pretty much I know some some of it um, we've discussed already, but it it sets the stage a lot for what we need to talk about in detail, which is uh, really um, around methods and <laughs> and some of the more advanced features of 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 uh, of common list. Um, because uh, there are some some recommendations about around methods that I'm just you know setting the stage here for next week uh, that uh, the book mentions that I'd like to hear thoughts about. So mm. for next week, you have a question. Yeah, what well, the, uh, the, but... the chapters that we should be covering is we're going to be starting with chapter five, which is um, on controlling the generic dispatch in um, class. This chapter talks about um, uh, ways of, you know, shadowing primary method implementations using around methods um, and um, a technique called method combination where we briefly touched based on about it in, in some previous episodes, but we've never really talked about it because there's a lot of internals that you need to kind of understand to really truly appreciate method combination. And um, this chapter goes through that. Well, chapter five and chapter six is the goal, um, but um, I don't know how far we'll get. Um, depends on how how quickly I could go through method combinations and some of the guidelines that the book you know spells out on that section. This is a fairly long um, long chapter, um, primarily because it goes through some design considerations that I think folks need to be aware of that. Uh, in um, practical common list, we, we only brushed brushed upon it. We never actually really dug deep into it. Uh, but until then, you know, it's just chapter five is primarily my goal. But if we have time, we might go through chapter six too. We'll see. Uh, but we'll see. Anyway, until next time, this is uh, Ron Vadim signing off. Um, thanks for all of you guys who joined me on this Labor Day. <laughs>